In September 1944, the British intelligence service listened in on the conversations of captured German generals. One of them made a sensational claim. Rommel said to me that the Führer has to be killed, there is nothing for it. That man has to go. The British couldn't believe what they were hearing. Hitler's favorite general, the legendary Desert Fox, had apparently turned against the Führer he had so gallantly fought for. But just a month later, it was the great field marshal who was dead. Rommel's funeral was a classic piece of Third Reich pageantry. It was a piece of theatre, essentially, although that he had insisted he didn't want any political decorations in, you know, during the service, such as swastikas. Of course, what do the Nazis do? They put swastikas everywhere and over his coffin. And of course, what the Nazis were doing, they were trying to show that Rommel had always been loyal to the regime to the bitter end. But it was a lie, and his wife and son had no choice but to go along with it. It was gespenstisch. It was spooky. We became part of the troupe of actors and pretended that everything was just as it should be. We didn't know how long freedom would prevail or if it might come to an end relatively quickly following the performance of this theatre piece. Germans were told he had died from injuries sustained in a car crash. The real cause of his death was covered up the great general was forced to poison himself. And there's the dead body of Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, one of you know, Germany's finest generals, a man who was revered not just by his own countrymen, but also people like Churchill and Montgomery. Um, and it was a very, very sad end for a man who's often regarded as being one of the greatest you know, leaders of all time. He was the German army's pop idol, a general who signed autographs. A great propaganda asset. His image was used to propagate the myth of German invincibility on the battlefield. It was in the Libyan desert where Rommel's reputation flourished and where friend and foe respectfully called him the Desert Fox. Libya was an Italian colony under threat from the British. Hitler had to reinforce his embattled Axis ally. Erwin Rommel and a small division of tanks landed in Tripoli in February 1941. He was there for defensive uh, purposes to uh, really shore up the Italians. Hitler is worried that a massive Italian defeat in North Africa might lead to his ally being knocked out of the war. So this is a limited liability deployment of a relatively junior, although skilled, general, just to make sure that that doesn't happen. So it's a political deployment as much as a, a military deployment. Hitler reassured Mussolini that Germany's boldest tank general would come to his rescue. Rommel had proven his mettle in the invasion of France the year before. Rommel commanded a unit called the 7th Panzer Division, uh, which was then eventually soon became known as the Ghost Division because it moved so quickly that no one knew where it was, so it was like a ghost. And even though German tanks were inferior and had worse armaments to their French counterparts, Rommel used speed, aggression, and surprise. As in France, Rommel's forces in Africa were relatively weak. The British knew this. They had intercepted and decoded Axis radio signals. But they also underestimated his speed and aggression. The British believe that, that not much has changed, whereas what Rommel brings is a, a completely different tactical mindset. Uh, and so even though the British know what forces he's got, he uses them in ways which they don't expect. The wily Desert Fox ordered his drivers to create huge clouds of dust to make his small division seem larger than it was. The British believed he would wait for reinforcements. Rommel launched a full-scale attack and caught them by surprise. 
he led from the front, endearing himself to the lower ranks of his Africa Corps troops. I had the impression that he was really in his element when things got serious. That is when they were firing at us or used artillery fire on us. I had the impression he was something of a war god who's looking for this. But the war god was once a reluctant soldier. It was Rommel's father who encouraged him to join Germany's Imperial Army in 1910. Rommel entered service as a cadet officer and was eventually promoted to the rank of lieutenant. He wanted to leave military service, but when he returned to his parents, they soon put him right. They said, you have to have a military career. And they also said that times are hard and you won't easily get a good position in Germany. Stay with it. This is your life. His talent for dynamic leadership emerged on the killing fields of the First World War. Rommel stands for a new type of warrior that emerges from the First World War. The assault troop fighter, the assault troop leader, people with initiative who knew their own mind and don't shy away from the fight, from the killing and dying. And Rommel becomes such an assault troop fighter. Rommel's first great victory unfolded at Monte Matteur in the Italian Alps. The strategic summit was held by Italian troops. Outnumbered, Rommel defied an order to hold the position, stormed the summit, and forced the Italian defenders to surrender. Rommel's reputation is very much built as this very, very dynamic, very, very gutsy, aggressive, fast-thinking, fast-acting general. And that really cements his reputation. His daredevil victory in the Italian Alps earned the once reluctant cadet the highest German military honor of the First World War, the Pour le Merite, or Blue Max. The young Rommel already has everything that will make the later Rommel. The talent to improvise, unconventional approaches, incredible stamina, toughness, bravery. It is impressive. Twenty-five years later, that stamina, toughness and bravery would once again score Rommel a famous victory against all odds. The wide expanse of sand and rock in the Libyan desert was a perfect setting for the deployment of his kind of unconventional, impulsive tactics. Rommel was what you might call an instinctive general. He understood a battlefield. He sensed when there was weakness. He sensed what you could do, what you couldn't do. Uh, he took enormous risks. He gambled a lot in North Africa. In the space of just a few weeks, Rommel's Africa Corps pushed the British almost a thousand kilometers east. By April 1941, he was closing in on Tobruk. But the rampant Rommel didn't realize that the port city had been transformed into a fortress ringed with defensive positions. Rommel surrounded it. On all sides, he surrounded Tobruk. And on the other side was the sea. And the only way that we could supply Tobruk was by the sea. The Africa Corps was in for a shock. Attacking a fortress was new to Rommel. He ordered his troops to smash through the defensive structures. Rommel immediately attacked and most of their forces were destroyed. I thought that was impetuous and, and was done without a great deal of planning and no reconnaissance. Despite his losses, and against the advice of the German high command, Rommel ordered attack after attack. More than a thousand foot soldiers and 53 officers fell in the failed assaults on Tobruk. Such losses sparked outrage and rebellion among fellow officers. Was 
It must have been a colonel or lieutenant colonel. Rommel said, why don't you continue to attack? The officer replied, sir, I have already had 50% casualties. Rommel said, so? Is that a reason to stop attacking? Continue your attack. So this colonel stood there and said, my soldiers will only go on over my dead body. His leadership was in crisis. As much as his foot soldiers admired him, staff officers became critical. Years later, towards the end of the war, senior officers in British captivity spelled out exactly what they thought of the Desert Fox. On a personal level, Rommel is a great guy, but there is no hint of a strategist. He isn't even a tactician, he can't lead at all. Because he was a very arrogant man and because he was a, an individual in many ways, he would be, he wanted to seek personal glory by taking his division or his corps or his army you know, out ahead of the rest. And throughout his entire military career, you see that repeated. And as a result, he earned a lot of enemies. One of those enemies would play a role in the downfall of the Desert Fox, General Heinrich Kirchheim. Kirchheim would not forgive or forget an accusation of cowardice. Rommel accuses him of cowardice, screams at him, yells at him, and that's a deep humiliation for Kirchheim. Because you can't accuse a German general of cowardice. That's the worst thing to accuse him of. And from then on, Kirchheim has an account to settle with Rommel. Naturally, dissent from fellow officers was not part of the propaganda image of the all-conquering hero. The desert fox that chased the hapless Tommies across North Africa. Goebbels' propaganda portrays him as a national socialist general par excellence. This is a man who doesn't ask many questions but acts. He's guided by his own mind and breaks the bands of reality with his will. This is how not just Goebbels, but the national socialist ideology sees the troop leader of a modern army. He was an incredibly distinguished figure to look at. And because he had, you know, Hitler's confidence and because he was so highly promoted in all the Nazi rags, um, he became this you know, important national figure. Rommel developed a talent for acting. He was a little vain in that respect. And sure, on the other hand, I ask myself which person isn't or which man isn't. He would throw himself into a posture on a tank and did in this way support that image. Rommel played the PR card incredibly well. First of all, he looked good. Um, you know, he was the classic lantern-jawed German army officer. He was handsome, he looked good in the uniform, he had a chest full of medals. It wasn't only Germans who fell for the propaganda image of the invincible warrior. Many of his British opponents built him up as a tactical genius. The problem for the Allied soldiers who were having to fight Rommel was that they had two things they had to overcome. First of all, they had to overcome their normal fear and anxiety about battle and so on and how they would perform. But then they also had to overcome their fear of Rommel, who seemed to be a, a kind of military magician, capable of doing things that no other general was capable of doing. One frustrated Allied commander even forbade his troops from mentioning the German Field Marshal's name. But his fame continued to spread. And like his Fuhrer, Rommel even made it onto the cover of Time magazine. Rommel's name has never really been seriously linked with war crimes. Uh, and I think that one of the reasons why Rommel's reputation has survived for so long after the Second World War uh, is that in the end he was, among uh, the main clutch of leading German generals, a, a decent man. The decent man had sacrificed many troops in a bid to take Tobruk, but the port city remained in Allied hands. In May 1942, Rommel renewed his attacks on the port city. The tanks and infantry of the Africa Corps 
were backed up by Stuka dive bombers that pounded the Allied garrison manned by South African troops. The next month, Rommel finally captured Tobruk. He announced the triumph himself. Herr General Oberst, darf ich gehorsam bitten, zu den Operationen hier kurz ein paar Worte zu sagen. Heute krönt die Truppe ihr bisheriges Werk durch Erobung der Festung Tobruk. Der Sieg der Nation ist sicher. I almost burst with pride, as if I had been there, and it was at the time something of a national event. A national event expertly stage managed by Hitler's propaganda chief, Josef Goebbels. The conqueror of Tobruk was paraded in the Berlin Sportpalast Stadium like a victorious gladiator. The Desert Fox was at the peak of his career and popularity. Hitler promoted him to the rank of Field Marshal. Morale was high, victory in Africa seemed within reach. There was boundless optimism, not just with Rommel, but really throughout the entire army and also amongst the officers. We could already see ourselves in Cairo. We were already talking about which hotel we would go to and where we would live. Which hotel will become our headquarters. Cairo was a long 700 kilometers away from Tobruk. But Rommel had a secret advantage. Long before victory in Tobruk, Axis forces had been able to intercept and decode the communications of a key figure at the British headquarters in Cairo the American military attaché, Colonel Bonner Fellers. He's very welcome in Cairo uh, because the British are trying to lure the Americans into alliance. Remember, America doesn't enter the war until December 1941. So of Bonner Fellers is getting absolutely golden information from the British because they want it transmitted back to Washington. And sadly for the British, the information is going straight to Rommel. Rommel referred to the American attaché as his good source. He could read his communications because of a rare coup by Germany's unpopular Italian Axis ally. Back in September 1941, Italian secret service agents slipped into the American embassy. They retrieved the black code of US diplomatic communications without anybody noticing. It gave the Desert Fox access to valuable information, like the strength and casualties of British forces in North Africa. It was very important. The thing that we need to understand is that the campaign in North Africa was very closely fought. And if you have that intelligence, you can configure your own forces, both in terms of numbers and where you put them, to strike at the enemy's weakest point. So order of battle intelligence is absolutely vital and gave Rommel an edge. It gave him the edge that he needed. It pushed him over the edge to success. So it was a slim margin, but it was an important margin. But this margin was lost in July 1942. The Americans realized their code was compromised. The code was changed and Colonel Bonner Fellers was sent home. The tables were turned. A key German radio reconnaissance team was captured, along with their codes and equipment. The Desert Fox was effectively fighting blind. In just one and a half years, Rommel pushed British forces back one and a half thousand kilometers, from Tripoli to a tiny Egyptian railway station in the middle of nowhere, El Alamein. This remote outpost became the British forces' last line of defense. 
a sprawling minefield was laid to block a German breakthrough to the Suez Canal. A new commander arrived, Bernard Montgomery. Montgomery had a, a really kind of robust respect for Rommel. It was a kind of adversary he wanted, if you like. And he became really in the end, rather obsessed with Rommel. You read in his you know, directives to his troops, you know, he has one task, and that's to, that's to defeat Rommel and drive him back. Not the Germans, but to defeat Rommel. The new British commander had the advantage. By the time they got to El Alamein, Rommel's troops were overexhausted and undersupplied. When we arrived in El Alamein, and I saw those few ridiculous tanks that were still drivable in our tank division, and I could see how exhausted the soldiers were, there was just a fraction left of the fighting forces. I realized that this couldn't go on, not in this condition. The Desert Fox was running out of tanks and fuel. Crucially, he could no longer decode valuable information about the enemy coming out of the American embassy in Cairo. He pulled rabbits out of hats again and again, and he can pull those rabbits out of hats because he has certain almost magical advantages in intelligence. He no longer has those advantages. He has no more rabbits that he can pull out of his hat. British counter-attack was launched in October 1942. They outnumbered Rommel's exhausted and severely depleted Africa Corps. After 10 days of battle, it was the Desert Fox who was forced into a humiliating retreat. The bad news reached Hitler's headquarters. The Führer was adamant German forces do not retreat. On the 3rd of November, Hitler ordered his Desert Fox to lead a fight to the death. You cannot show your troops any other way than that to victory or to death. Rommel defied his Führer and ordered a full-scale retreat. The Africa Corps surrendered all of its gains. It was forced back even further from the point it had started from. Under constant fire from the ground and air, even in retreat, the Desert Fox pulled off an impressive achievement. He got his survivors all the way to Tunisia. I think most of the generals, including Rommel, didn't believe they would make it to Tunisia. It was a tactical masterpiece, and perhaps this retreat to Tunisia is Rommel's greatest military achievement overall. Hitler blocked any retreat to Sicily. 130,000 Africa Corps troops were taken prisoner, but Rommel was evacuated well before his British pursuers arrived. It wasn't a happy goodbye. On his side too, you could see that. But he left with the feeling that this is all over in North Africa. And he probably felt then that it would not come to an overall victory anymore. His new posting couldn't have been more different. From sprawling desert, he ended up on the Atlantic coast. Rommel was put in charge of German defenses against an Allied landing in Normandy. The so-called Atlantic Wall was vulnerable, and so was Rommel's belief in his Führer and the Nazi Reich. When the war was going well, like many members of the general staff, he was very happy you know, to keep fighting. But when the war starts going the other way, that's when you get people like Rommel starting to question Hitler. So when Hitler's delivering the victories and, and everything's you know, rosy, fine. They'll overlook the excesses of Nazism. And, uh, but when things are going badly, 
Rommel starts looking at it and he starts to regard it much more negatively. When he told me about the mass shootings in Poland and also that Jews were being murdered with gas, as he had heard from Strolin, the mayor of Stuttgart. So he did know. But how do you get out of this? Your own state as a criminal. The tide had turned against the German war machine. Even though he was plagued with doubt and the prospect of another defeat, he played the role expected of him. In private, the great field marshal, once Hitler's favorite, was becoming increasingly critical of Hitler, the war, and German defenses. The feared and much anticipated invasion came on the 6th of June, 1944. The Atlantic Wall crumbled. The D-Day landing forces established a bridgehead on the Normandy coast. Rommel now faced the combined might of Allied forces, including a vast array of American military hardware. Nazi Germany was fighting a losing battle on two fronts. Rommel tried to convince his Führer that for him, the war was over. I think he still believed in the possibility of influencing Hitler. During their meetings, he tried to tell Hitler what it looked like and that they should end it in the West. But Hitler answered, look after your military tasks and not tasks that you are not responsible for. And he pretty much sent him away. Germany was losing the war, but making his Führer face that fact was one battle the Desert Fox couldn't win. After what would be his last meeting with Hitler in June 1944, Rommel was approached about an explosive plot to end the war and the Führer's life. Rommel's involvement in the Stauffenberg plot, the famous 20th of July assassination attempt, is shrouded somewhat in mystery and it's very hard to be definitive. But we do know certain things. We do know that he was approached in France um, and asked whether he wanted to support it. One of those approaches was made by a visitor to Rommel's French headquarters 11 days before the bomb plot exploded. Army officer César von Hofacker was part of the Count von Stauffenberg resistance movement. He was welcomed by Rommel's chief of staff, Hans Speidel, another resistance member. Rommel and Hofacker spoke in private. What was said in that crucial half hour is still open to debate. Rommel then spoke to his chief of staff, Hans Speidel. After the war, Speidel claimed they had talked about putting pressure on Hitler. No one can be sure how far Rommel was prepared to go. Unfortunately, we only have the statements given by Hans Speidel after the war. You can take these for what they are, the post-war statements of a participant, but of course, also a participant who is interested in shedding an advantageous light on his role in the circumstances of the 20th of July, 1944. One thing is certain. Six days after the visit, Speidel and Rommel drew up a letter to Hitler. Rommel's thoughts on the situation included an outrageous suggestion to Hitler. This uneven fight is coming to an end. It is necessary to draw the right conclusions from this situation. Few, if any, other German generals would dare suggest to the Führer that his war was unwinnable. Rommel signed it with his own hand. Any kind of capitulation was out of the question for Hitler. 
But Rommel was not the only army officer considering drastic action to end the war. I spoke openly about this with Rommel, that it was necessary to put an end to things soon in order to let the West march into Berlin rather than the East. Rommel hoped to make contact with his old adversary in Africa, the British Field Marshal Montgomery. He had no idea that at the same time, a British SAS commando unit was preparing to kidnap and, if necessary, kill him. Rommel saw Montgomery as a chivalrous adversary, and in a way he trusted him, which of course also shows that in the end he is politically naive. In the end, he is characterized by the chivalrous military tradition of a bygone time. The 17th of July, 1944, was a fateful day for the Desert Fox. He met several of his frontline commanders. In the afternoon, he was with a trusted tank general, Heinrich Eberbach. This conversation with Eberbach is the last one on a long day. He has a special connection with him. They're both from Swabia and trust each other. In a quiet corner, they have a confidential talk amongst themselves. Eberbach was captured by the British a few weeks later. He told several other prisoners about his last meeting with Rommel. The British were listening in when the tank general delivered a bombshell. Rommel said to me out there at the front, there is no option left to somehow sensibly make it through with Germany, other than killing the Führer and his closest associates as soon as possible. This document is a very strong indication, but no proof, that Rommel talked to Eberbach very openly and that Rommel was prepared to accept Hitler's death in this situation, or perhaps even wished for it. But not all historians agree that Rommel really wanted Hitler dead, as British records seem to suggest. In my view, this document contradicts everything we know about Rommel. It doesn't fit his character, it doesn't fit his connection to Hitler, and it also doesn't fit the actual situation of June and July in 1944. Rommel didn't want Hitler killed. I think Rommel was very canny to think that, and he was in some ways much further ahead than the other plotters. I think that you know he realized that actually if you killed Hitler, you would make him a martyr. After his talk with Heinrich Eberbach, Rommel was making his way back to his French headquarters when RAF fighters almost eradicated the Desert Fox. Allied aircraft ruled the skies over Normandy. Driving on open roads was a big risk. Around six o'clock that evening, fire aimed at Rommel's staff car rained down from the sky. My father was catapulted from the car, covered in splinters. We were glad that my father had survived. My mother told me that he had been injured. It was another stark indication that Germany was losing the war in the West. But the Desert Fox could not offer the surrender he wanted. From what he had heard of what was going on in the East, he knew that was a different kind of war. That, that was a, a, a war of barbarism and, 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 and absolute deep horror. Um, and I think like any other German, Rommel was unexceptional in wanting to be overrun, if by anybody, by the British and the Americans rather than by the Russians. The resistance that involved members of Rommel's own staff took direct action in a bid to end the war. 
On the 20th of July, 1944, a bomb exploded under Hitler's feet at his East Prussian headquarters. The Führer survived. True to his word, Hitler, seen here visiting some of the survivors injured in the blast, wreaked a terrible revenge. Hitler's wrath would also envelop the desert fox. Rommel was himself in hospital, recovering from the air attack on his car. He wrote to his wife, in addition to my accident, the attempt on the Führer's life has shocked me especially. We can thank God that it ended so well. This is an insurance. It is to play the loyal Führer follower, the steady disciple, as an insurance. It is written for the censors. The fact that he later keeps his family and his closest circles out of the real events and simply says, I didn't know anything about it. For me, this is a strategy to protect the people who are dear to him. There was no protection for the conspirators dragged before the so-called People's Court and the savage verdicts of Hitler's blood judge, Roland Freisler. Many of the accused were tortured and beaten before their humiliation in front of a ranting judge. One famous name emerged from the Gestapo interrogations and torture of bomb plot suspects. The celebrated public legend, the Desert Fox, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. Rommel represents a, a huge figure in the regime. He's a very popular, charismatic figure. He's seen as the uh, embodiment of German military success. Um, so what are they gonna do? Are they gonna put this man on trial? Um, you know, Germany's most famous field marshal is actually a traitor. Are they really going to allow that to be, you know, seen out in, a, in, in the, the public sphere in a trial? Perhaps that's why Hitler hesitated. Either way, an alternative had to be found to deal with a celebrity implicated in the bomb plot. Two months after the assassination attempt, Senior German army officers convened a so-called Court of Honor, or Ehrenhof. It was to identify any suspects still within the ranks and pass them on to Hitler's executioners. Rommel was one of those whose fate had to be decided. If you look at the composition, they are all no friends of Rommel. I put this very carefully. They decide over Speidel or Rommel. There is only an either-or in this case. Speidel or Rommel. The Gestapo claimed that during questioning, Speidel admitted he'd heard about the plan to attack Hitler and that he'd passed that information on to his superior, Rommel. That made the Desert Fox responsible. After the war, Speidel denied that he'd ever implicated his boss. Any record that he did has never been found. Speidel or Rommel, it was up to the court of honor to decide. An old adversary had a deciding vote. Heinrich Kirchheim, the officer Rommel had accused of cowardice back in Africa in 1941. Kirchheim apparently became very vocal during the course of the investigations that Rommel must have had insights. And the way I see Kirchheim was that this news pleased him. Kirchheim still had to settle a number of accounts with Rommel. He didn't forget the humiliation in April-May of 1941. A majority of officers, including Kirchheim, voted to let Speidel off the hook. This is a death sentence for Rommel. 
from Hitler and his accomplices' point of view, he must have been involved in the 20th of July bomb plot. That is the forced conclusion. Before Hitler's henchmen struck, Erwin Rommel had the chance to spend some time at home near Ulm in southern Germany and talk to his teenage son. I suddenly realized that there are serious sympathies for the conspirators and that he was shocked that they had been excluded from the army and hanged. The wily commander seemed to sense that the noose around his own neck was getting tighter. Then there were these Gestapo men in front of the house, day and night in their car. And my father said, we won't make it so easy for them that I will let myself be shot. And he ordered a military guard that took over his house. So it became increasingly obvious that he was somehow involved in all this. Rommel's enemies were poised to strike. Influential enemies, like Hitler's chief administrator, Martin Bormann. You do get people like Martin Bormann and bigwigs like that who absolutely despise Rommel. They think he's an overrated general. They think that, you know, he has Hitler's confidence unnecessarily. Um, but certainly Nazis squabbling amongst each other was very much the way that Hitler liked to keep things. You know, he was a classic divide and rule dictator. The Desert Fox was accused of complicity in the bomb plot in September 1944. Several of the accused that are still alive said that the field marshal had been in the picture about the attack. Rommel had said that he would be at the service of the new government after the successful attack. A human being is being denunciated here, even with small issues. It says in this file he is very vain. He has glasses but only uses them to read maps. Grubby. Someone is letting go of his hatred. After speaking to Hitler, Martin Bormann left the final act up to the senior army general dubbed Hitler's lackey, Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel. His former enemies put together a pact against Rommel. It starts at the Ehrenhof and ends in Hitler's immediate surroundings with Bormann and Keitel. On the 14th of October, 1944, the death envoys finally arrived at the Rommel family home. There are two German generals from Hitler's staff called Bergdorf and Meisel, and they explain to him that he has two options. He can either face the people's court and be tried for his involvement in the Stauffenberg bomb plot and face the ignominy uh, and the disgrace and his family might be sent to a, a camp, uh, there'll be no pension for his family and his name will be dirt forevermore in, in the Third Reich. Um, or his other option is to uh, use this little vial of uh, cyanide. He was really agitated. He was also pale, but in control. His voice didn't waver, and this seemed the best solution to him. He said that nothing about the real events could become public, otherwise the family is gone without trace. Less than an hour later, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel was dead. A memorial marks the spot where he committed suicide on a hill outside his hometown. A death mask preserved the face of the commander respected by soldiers on both sides, the honorable warrior they called the Desert Fox. Brand new Nazi C 